Let us now invite second speaker, Mr. Ho Chai Tik, who will share with us about the latest thoughts and efforts on coastal protection in Singapore. Let us welcome him. Yeah, thanks, Ting Chu. Okay, thanks everyone for staying tuned to, to this talk. I don't think I can qualify myself as an expert, but I'll share whatever I know based on my uh, experience in this area of work for the past 20 odd years. Okay, so my outline for today's talk is on these three areas. I'll briefly touch on the globe, uh, the effects of climate change, how it affects the global and environment, in particular, how Singapore will feel the effects of it. Then, of course, we'll touch on PUB's effort in adapting to climate change. This will be discussed more or less briefly because I think today's focus is more on the third part, which is on coastal protection. So this part, I'll just briefly touch on the water supply and how we deal with inland flood issues. So the focus will be on coastal protection, which I will briefly, I will cover the holistic risk assessment aspect that PUB is embarking on, the phase and integrated approach to which we try to plan our coastal protection strategies, and some pilots and research that we intend to carry or are already carrying since the past couple of years. So the global effect of climate change, I think as what Dr. Aura has mentioned earlier, all of us know what are the projected effects. Temperature will rise. Sea level will also rise. And why does this happen? Because when we have more greenhouse gas collected in the atmosphere, it traps the heat. And with growing temperature, everybody knows things expand. So the ocean body will expand, sea level will rise. And at the same time, when the temperature rise, ice caps your polar areas will start have the ice in the, these areas will start melting. And this will introduce more water into the sea body. And because of all this, the sea level will rise. How much is it? It remains something like looking at the crystal ball. We are trying to see what is going to happen in the next 50 years, 100 years, or even beyond. But based on what is observed in the past two decades or so, you can see the warmest years are actually recorded in 2015, 2016, and 2019. And along with it, you see uh, major impacts of floods in areas like Germany, China. So these are things that happen globally. And even in this year, uh, we do have flood events covering uh, several parts of the different continents as well. So Singapore is really not spared from climate change. Being a small island city, changes in daily temperature is going to affect us, right? I think for me, I hear my grandparents telling me, oh, Singapore is never as hot as it was before. So I think even human beings can feel this subtle increase in temperature. What more if temperature will rise even more significantly going forward? Then, of course, when we have more hot days, that means more water is evaporating and is being collected in the atmosphere. When things like that happen and the temperature change, we experience more intense rainfall. That is to be expected because when you have more water vapor in the atmosphere, when the rain eventually, when the clouds condense and the rain comes down, it's going to be more severe and you get more rainfall and you will experience floods. And together with this, there'll be changes in wind, which causes quite substantial effects, especially if in Singapore, you have high-rise buildings, you have strong winds hitting us. Imagine what this will do to our fixtures and our attachments to high-rise buildings. But not least, of course, is the sea level rise, which everybody is very concerned about because this is an existential issue that threatens all island state nations like Singapore. So as what Prime Minister Lee mentioned in one of in the National Day Rally in 2019, tackling climate change is something like what we need to do with our defense. We need to be prepared so that we can be ready for whatever that comes along our coastline. Singapore is just a tiny red dot. There's nowhere for us to hide. So we have to hold our areas remain adequately protected for whatever uncertainties that are to come. So with that, he mentioned the three-pronged approach, understanding the issue. That's why we have research institutes like CCRS looking at what is going to happen in the coming years uh, because of climate change. What are the effects? What are the impacts that could be uh, ensued because of all these uh, situations? Then we need to mitigate with measures in the sense that we try to reduce emissions and increase our carbon sinks so that we try to abate the accumulation of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. With all this done, there is still a threat of change rising sea levels because sea level is already rising. So we need to adapt to the change. And that's why we need to look at all this to see how we can best deal with the changing effects of climate change. So in PUB's context, there are three-pronged areas that we need to work with. So one is that we need to enhance water security. Two, we need to look at increasing flood resilience because of rainfall. Last but not least is to strengthen coastal protection. So I'll briefly touch on the first two before moving into more detail in the third one. So in terms of enhancing water security, we have heard 
uh, the opening that we have diversified our water resources, right? So we moved to four national taps. And among all this, you realize that things like new water, desalinated water, is not really linked to climate because new water, we recycle whatever, what's already in our system, right? Mm -hmm. Desalinated water is to bring in water that is around us and we can use it as potable water, right? These are some strategies that we are putting forth. So by doing that, we reduce our reliance on collecting rainwater and imported water for our water supply. Of course, when we deal with that, we also need to look at flood resilience, right? When we have intense rainfall, what happens? In the earlier days, it used to be the case that, okay, when rain drops to the ground, we try as fast as possible to get the rainwater away, collect them in drains and drain them up to the sea. But going forward, as things become more extreme, we get more intense rainfall, more frequent rainfalls, do we want to build drains so huge that maybe they are only used 1% of the time, whereas the rest of the time, they are just empty banks, right? So this is a lot of uh, space constraint. Uh, the space constraint in Singapore, this is something that we have to factor in uh, developing our inland flood resilience strategies. And hence, there was this strategy thought up, the source pathway receptor concept that helps to bring about all these uh, ideas to try to prevent the drastic peak in intense rainfall and thereby overwhelming our drainage infrastructure. So these two uh, strategies you can see, one is more on the water supply where we need to ensure that there's su sufficient supply to cater to population's needs. And the other part is to ensure that flood doesn't occur. So when climate change, when there's drought or when there's intense rainfall, you find that half of PUB can sleep soundly, the other half is buried. And whether it's a drought or is it a heavy rainfall, such events happen. So these are things that we have to grapple with to find the right balance. So with that, I move on to the next area, which is the coastal protection effort in Singapore. So what is PUB doing in this? So some of the key challenges in coastal protection is there are uncertainties in climate change projections, particularly in sea level rise, right? We roughly know by 2100, studies have shown that sea level will rise by up to one meter. That's the mean sea level, right? Uh, combined with effects of tides, storm surges, this could reach four to five meters above the mean sea level, the, uh, the current mean sea level. So these are things that we need to understand better to be able to better develop the appropriate strategies to deal with these uh, effects. And with this case, how it affects Singapore is being a highly developed nation, island nation, with limited land and not much high ground, it is a really existential problem, right? So more than 30% of Singapore's land is not more than 5 meters above mean sea level, and a small land area covering just slightly more than 720 square kilometers to meet competing needs of the nation. It's one of the busiest ports in the world, and it has a population density of more than 8,000 a square kilometer. So imagine if Singapore, if certain parts of Singapore were to be inundated, we don't have the luxury that, oh, it's just rice paddies that are flooded, it's just uh, forests that are flooded, but it's people mm -hmm. staying there with our integrated areas of communities and the facilities. And this could all affect our daily way of life. So some of the typical coastal protection measures in Singapore currently uh, deployed are as shown uh, below. On top left side, you have the sloping revetment, which is the vast majority of Singapore's uh, coastal protection measures. Top right hand side, you have the vertical seawalls that are deployed in certain areas where we need more of an urban outlook and we need to maximize uh, land use. Bottom left is the barrage and the pumping station, which serves multi functions. Right. It is able to hold out the seawater, enabling us to have a freshwater reservoir behind it. And with this, we are able to control floods in the low-lying downtown and city areas. At the same time, you see from the nice picture, the nice area picture, it has a beautiful rooftop area for people to have recreational, uh, recreational uh, time during the weekends or during the off, uh, during the uh, all times of the week. Right. If you go over to the barrage on the weekends, you'll find that it's fully populated with families enjoying picnics or having a fun flying kites in this area. Then the lower right is a mangrove uh, hybrid rock revetment, which is uh, being deployed in certain areas where such uh, uh, site, uh, site 
situation allows for it. So in terms of global sea level rise, I mentioned that there are many different scenarios being painted. Right? Dr. Orell shared earlier, there are many uh, possible trajectories in how sea level could rise over the years. So you can see now it's already in 2022. There are now studies to look at 2050, 2100, and 2150. As you go further into the future, you find that the divergence in the projections increase because of uncertainties, right? So maybe in the next 30 years, we are quite certain. So you see the, the divergence at the 2050 level is pretty small. But you come to 2100, the divergence more than triple. You go further beyond that at 2150, probably about 10 times in terms of divergence. With this, what do we do? Do we build to the highest and waste all the resources that could be better deployed in the interim? I think this is something that we need to uh, understand better and to be able to factor in and plan accordingly in our strategies. So some of the coastal protection effort done uh, is started since BCA was appointed as the lead coastal protection agency around 2009 or 2008. So they have carried out the recent study and the coastal adaptation study, which I had the chance to be involved in previously. So from these studies, we understand that already about 70% of coastline is protected by structures, but these effectively protect us against erosion, right? So to ensure that we need protection against sea level rise, they will have to be enhanced, upgraded, or built higher to ensure that water is held out at the coastline. So PUB took over in 2020 as the National Coastal Protection Agency. So our objectives of coastal protection are as follows. Number one, small island surrounded by sea, we need to prevent loss of life. You have heard, you have seen news articles about other areas when a flood situations, people get, people drown, people are swept away, or they are trapped underground, right? So to us, safety is perennial. We, it's of utmost importance and we need to prevent loss of life. Of course, we cannot come to a situation that we say that there is no flood at all. You'll be very expensive. So what we need to do is we need to minimize damage to assets and infrastructure and be able to carry on life with minimal disruption even after a flood were to happen and the waters start to recede. Finally, we must also preserve the functionality of land such that we know that when sea level rise, the rise is likely to be permanent unless the ice age comes and the sea water start receding, right? So we need to preserve the functionality of land and we need to make sure that our precious tracts of land do not get inundated permanently by the sea. So some of the strategies we need to deal with are as, are as follows. First, as island nation, we simply need to build a continuous line of defense to keep out rising sea. But of course, when we say that, everybody immediately think, oh, that means we'll build an ugly, tall structure along the entire coastline, like the Great Wall of Singapore. This cannot happen because you don't see any part of the world doing it because first, it's not sustainable. Two, you find that it is not able uh, to ensure that our waterfront industries continue to have access to the sea. That's where they need to carry on the business. Our ports need to dock alongside to be able to unload their cargo to do transshipment operations. So there's a need to tweak this kind of strategy with the land use of the area. And since we need to do this anyway, this gives us an opportunity to see how we can think out of the box, create a better coastal and marine environment, not only serving the function of coastal protection, but enable space to be better utilized by everyone in Singapore as well. And certain areas, you need higher levels of protection. Why? Because, as I mentioned, we need to maintain functionality and continuity in our business, our way of life. So certain things like your critical infrastructure, your critical assets cannot be down, right? You cannot imagine Singapore without power for a day, right? Everything will shut down. You cannot even have this webinar, right? Uh, telecommunication infrastructure is going increasingly important. And so are your major uh, transshipment and your port and airport facilities. And hence for such areas, you probably need additional localized protection to ensure that these facilities remain adequately protected 
in the near to medium term and the long term. Finally, uh, to ensure that inland flood is well contained, that's where the source pathway receptor approach has been brought in to deal with stormwater management. So with this, there are basically three key areas in how we carry this out. So in terms of one, is the holistic risk assessment, which I will delve in more detail in the next two slides. Two is being flexible and adaptable so that we are able to build measures to deal with uncertainty. So we try to do planning of uh, or coming up with solutions that enable us to flexibly build up over the years instead of building everything up at one go. Because not only you are wasting resources for something that you may need only 50, 60 years down the road, the moment you complete building them, you need to maintain them. So it's going to be a, a, a dramatic increase in the life cycle costing of coastal protection measures if we do not plan properly. So we need to build and in an adaptive and sustainable way so that we remain adequately protected, but we do not over provide. Third, of course, is when we look at the land use within the area, we try to, as far as possible, blend coastal protection measures with the in-situ constraints of the land use so that it fit into the coastal environment nicely. And by doing that, we are able to save land by having the same piece of land doubling up as coastal protection measure, but enable it to be used uh, for infrastructure like your park connectors, cycling tracks, or even your coastal parks. So why do we need to do a holistic risk assessment? Singapore, just a small island city, completely surrounded by the sea, we have more than 1,000 kilometers of rivers, canals, and outlet drains. Many of them directly discharge to the sea. So when sea level rise, there's this backwater effect that pushes the sea level much further inland, and that will affect the capacity of a drainage system. So by doing this model simulations, we are able to better understand how this our drainage system could be affected by rising sea levels, especially in the event of extreme events like tidal uh, spring tides or surge events within, uh, within the region. And do know that Singapore is actually semi diurnal So some parts have maybe one high tide, one low tide a day, but most areas have two high tides and two low tides a day. So imagine waters in your drainage network, especially nearer to the sea, is going to rise up and down together with the tidal cycle. Right? This will affect the efficacy of this drainage network when dealing with heavy rainfall that comes down further inland. So PUB is doing is developing this coastal inland flood model. Why do we need that? Because we need to understand if a storm were to brew in the South China Sea or in the Real Archipelago, we know when this reaches our shoreline, what will be ultimate water level that will hit our shores? With this, we can then understand, okay, this will then be the boundary conditions where for our other drains that discharge directly to the sea. And then we can make an assessment how our drainage network could be affected or impacted, right? So that is the coastal part. Uh, we understand what's going to affect our outlets, whether it will change the efficiency of drainage system, whether the drain will be overwhelmed nearer the outlet. On the inland model side, we need, to understand because Singapore is densely developed, our drainage network and how rainfall drops to the ground and how it's channeled to the drainage network is very different from how it behaves in other countries, which are maybe vast, very hilly, and there's a lot of uh, vegetation involved, right? So in Singapore, because a lot of areas are quite urbanized, basically every drop of rain that drops down will just remain on the surface and we just need to channel it out in an uh, efficient and effective manner. So I think that's why I brought about the earlier point that uh, PUB has come up with this source pathway receptor concept in terms of dealing with stormwater management. So in the model is one aspect, coastal model is one aspect, right? I mentioned that coastal model will determine the, effect, effect, uh, the boundary conditions because of changing tides and impending such events hitting Singapore. If this were to coincide with extreme rainfall inland, how do this interplay and how do this interact with one another? This is something that PUB need to study to enable a more holistic risk assessment going forward. So in terms of doing coastal protection measures, it's a long-term endeavor. Coastal protection infrastructure does not take just three to five years to complete. You need maybe two to three decades 
to get everything done up just for the coastline of main island Singapore is going to be that long. So I think we are starting with uh, site-specific studies to look at the city's coast, Sentosa, northwestern part of uh, Singapore, as well as Jurong Island, because these are the areas that have been identified to be uh, to be where if inundation occurs, it's going to be quite impactful. And hence, we need to address these areas first. And we are doing this phasing so that we do not have bunching up of resources, not only when studying, but also when we implement the actual measures. Bear in mind that these measures take time to construct and this will require construction materials to build them up, right? Where do we get materials? They are not from Singapore. We have to import them. So I think this is something that we have to plan in a holistic way and phase it appropriately so that we remain adequately protected in the near, mid to long term. Of course, when we look at all these measures, I think uh, I have no coastal protection measures that can really uh, uh, explain that. That's why I draw this Pishan, uh, uh, the Kalang River Pishan Amokyo Park as example, right? When we do integrated planning approach to achieve multiple benefits, the earlier version, uh, those of us who know the Pishan Amokyo Park, it used to be one large concrete canal that runs along the park. It has been torn down and it has uh, been converted into what is shown below. It's multifunctional design. So during dry weather, just see a small stream uh, at the bottom, but the grass banks allow people to make use of it, play with it, observe the biodiversity, look at the greenery, enjoy the greenery in the area, or even uh, just doing some uh, observation of the nature that is uh, thriving in those areas. So it's some, something that allows us to harmoniously bring together your flood alleviation system and your park facilities to allow people to enjoy uh, during different parts of the time. And of course, when there's heavy rainfall and the uh, grass banks are expected to be flooded, there'll be sirens to warn people out so that people can be evacuated in time to avoid any uh, uh, catastrophe. Uh, the bottom right side is some uh, hybrid system that was done at Pulau Tekong to try to see how mangroves and rock revermen can be seamlessly interweaved. Uh, but these are still in the pilot stage, so uh, there's a need to study how this can be more effective and we have more data to prove that it is uh, efficient and effective in uh, coastal in coastal protection uh, functions. So I will also touch on some of the pilots that were carried out in coastal protection area. So this particular uh, pilot was carried out, completed in 2010. Uh, it invo involves using uh, drill bags, which is uh, in, in, uh, in uh, layman's term, is very large sandbags. Right. Just that the material to form this bag, specially formulated geofabric, uh, is a man-made material uh, comprising, I think, polypropylene that is able to hold the sand in place. Uh, it's also designed to be UV resistant because I think such material would naturally degrade under uh, exposure to ultraviolet light when under the sunlight. So this was deployed as a pilot uh, near to the uh, section of the beach near to the road safety park because there was some severe erosion uh, earlier on and it was highlighted as a potential safety uh, concern, right? So this was piloted and from 2010 until now, actually there was no further effort to improve it or to enhance it, but the 10 year study have shown that it works perfectly at this location. I need to stress that it's at this location because this solution may not work in other areas. Uh, this solution is very good in this area where, uh, where we still want good access to the beachfront where the beach goers can just clamber down two or three back layers to go to the beach and there will not be any injury because of slip and fall cases. If the drop in the level is too large, which I will show in the next, next example, this will not work because imagine we have, now you see about two to three layers to get down the beach. Imagine if this was eight to nine layers. I don't think you want to go down to the beach because it's going to be a dangerous feat. So at another section of the East Coast Park, this was the composite step room that was created. Prior to the installation of this measure, there was actually, I think, almost a three meter cliff right at the edge of the shoreline uh, because I think uh, it was not properly dealt with. And hence with this measure, uh, we cannot use the drawback method here because it's simply too high. So we built a rock development at the bottom half of the structure, but at the top half, we created up to three steps for people to maybe just sit down and enjoy. This was, this was another pilot 
that was carried out. Initially, there was some uncertainty about it, uh, but after being uh, completed, in fact, you can see over weekends, this become a new focal area for large public, uh, for a lot of Singaporeans, and people just go there, enjoy the scenery, and look at the sunset. Right? These are some things that we piloted and proved to be successful, and these are things that we can continue to try out and to see whether these are possible solutions that can add on to the basket of potential uh, measures that we can deploy in other parts of Singapore. Of course, another ongoing project under PUB is the pilot polder project at Pulau Tekong. Well, for this particular project, land was deliberately reclaimed below mean sea level. So we need to have polder dike to hold up the sea so that this land will remain well protected. Well, I mentioned that Singapore is not uh, below mean sea level earlier on, but we are not too high, right? 30% of land is less than five meters above mean sea level. So we are not in this situation yet like Holland, where the land is below mean sea level, but we need to be prepared. Hence the need for this pilot to see how we can understand the intricacies of having this system, how we can operate it effectively, and how we can maintain it so that this becomes an effective solution going forward. So this is a system that PUB is going to take over. Uh, when it's completed and look at the maintenance and operation of it so that we can better understand the system. At the same time, we are also developing new solutions for Singapore. Uh, this is under this uh, Global Innovation Challenge uh, that was launched uh, sometime last year. So we are in work with uh, the Delta Marine Consultants to see what are uh, some measures that are already developed for Netherlands and how it can be customized to fit Singapore's context how we can deal with this going forward. Of course, with this, we need to look at the research areas. So these are, we are look, planning for a dedicated research focusing on coastal protection and flood management. And these are areas that we intend to drive uh, research effort so that we can grow uh, the research ecosystem community within Singapore and look at all these areas in conjunction with the pilots, in conjunction with all the strategies that we are putting forth. So by doing this, it helps us better understand what are the new advancements in technolog technologies going forward, which of these will be suitable for Singapore, and if we do not understand enough of them, what can we do to better have research effort to find out information that will make these measures and strategies relevant to Singapore's context. Of course, above all this, we need to ensure that climate adaptation or coastal protection effort is not just PUB's effort. It's a whole of nation effort. The government need to build consensus of what we need to do. That's why there is this Singapore Green Plan. We need to try to have everybody coming together to understand, okay, what are the trade-offs of the different measures? How best do we deal with the solutions? And which are the solutions we can work on? We also need European experts and the institutes of higher learning where we can build knowledge through research and development, we grow local capability, we train the local workforce to feed the industry and have people to take on projects and effectively bring all these plans to fruition. Of course, we also need to come to industry where they are on the ground, they can best understand the situation, the constraints and the context. And in terms of design construction of protection measures, they are the best place people to better assist us in understanding, okay, what works, what do not work. Then this will help us be more focused in our coastal protection effort. And last but not least, we also need to deal with community. The community need to understand why is climate changing? What are the effects? What are the impacts? Most importantly, they need to understand for everything that we build, there are trade-offs what we can accept, what we cannot accept. And at the same time, we also need to uh, acclimatize community to the fact that there is no such thing as flat free. It's just simply too expensive. And yes, this is where we need to build community resilience to let people understand, okay, other than what the government and all of Singapore can do, what can we do to make sure that we are less affected by impending flood situations and what everybody can come together to avert any calamities that come along our way. I think with that, I've come to the end of my sharing. Yeah, thank you.